Welcome everybody um, to this special event today, Bridging the Systems Capability Gap, uh, where we're going to looking at how we might improve decision making in order to create a better world. And there's probably never been a, a more important topic at a more important moment in time. So welcome to everyone. Uh, I believe we've got an audience from around the world. So uh, uh, as I say, welcome to this event run by the Enlightened, Enlightened Enterprise Academy. Uh, my name is Andy Wilkins. I'm founder of a, a think tank called Future of Health, which, as you can imagine, health has systems thinking right at the core of this. So this is a topic very uh, dear to my heart. Um, I also run a, a podcast series called The Meta Perspective, uh, looking at these some of these bigger questions. And I've been working closely with Paul, uh, working on the development of some of the themes and ideas and events that the Enlightened, Enlightened Enterprise Academy are putting on. But let's set the stage for today's event. Um, there is obviously general agreement, I think it's fair to say, across business, the third sector, government and international organisations that increased complexity is the primary challenge that we're facing. And that's for a variety of reasons, VUCA, which we've explored before, exponential technology, and an increasing array of systemic challenges that we see around us are, are providing new and greater challenges. So systems thinking and practice has been identified as the best way of seeking to both understand and potentially manage that complexity. But as we know, systems thinking is still a relatively young transdiscipline rarely taught at university and yet to establish itself as a go-to approach for decision making. So we therefore have a considerable gap between the real world complexities that demand our response and the systems thinking capabilities of decision makers uh, charged with the responsibility to respond. Uh, and as we see it, look around us, there are numerous examples of institutional failures at every level from local to international to even international settings. More recently, COVID-19, of course, has exposed many weaknesses in our health systems. And beyond that, we seem unable to tackle inequalities and the problems posed by an aging population, uh, including food, water, and now energy crises. And these are becoming increasingly common, even in so-called developed economies. And of course, our event is taking place against the backdrop of COP26, uh, the climate change meeting in Glasgow. And this probably represents the greatest systemic challenge in human history. And few are expecting that Glasgow, the Glasgow totes will solve the crisis that we are facing. Now, the result of so many system failures has been uh, also a collapse in levels of confidence in our political and economic systems, and even of our trust in leaders. Uh, citizens frequently complain the system isn't working. And as we're seeing, this leads to greater social and political polarization and political instability. So these are big pressing problems uh, of, of, of great gravity. And while many leaders readily accept the problems they face are systemic in nature, they seem to be at a loss how to respond. So this question of systems thinking really has never been more important. So the Critical Systems Forum, which is organized by the Enlightened Enterprise Academy, uh, has been created with uh, the guidance and participation of Dr. Mike Jackson, who's with us today. He's uh, a pioneer in the pluralistic approach to systems thinking and author uh, of the recent highly acclaimed book, Critical Systems Thinking and the Man Management of Complexity, published by Wiley in 2019. Now, the Critical Systems Forum will soon become an institute and solving the systems thinking capability gap will be a central purpose for that institute. So look out for more news on that. Now our conference today will explore this systems thinking capability gap and exploring if this is indeed as existentially serious an issue as we believe it to be. And if so, how do we go about addressing it? And we really hope to get uh, deep into some of these topics today. Now, uh, is with regards to the agenda, Paul, you might want to pop up the agenda. Um, we will hear three provocations from three senior leaders, and this will set off the, uh, the course of, of this, this afternoon's event, who will discuss the capabilities they see contemporary decision makers needing. 
Then in response, there will be uh, three systems, uh, systems thinkers uh, or respondees including and, and uh, Michael uh, Jackson as well, who will outline what they think taking a systems approach has to offer. And then when, of course, I'm sure all of you here will have many thoughts and ideas, so we'll have a moderated Q&A and also a participative discussion uh, that follows that. Um, for housekeeping, we want this to be as interactive as possible, so please do post your comments and questions uh, in the chat, which we will use for the Q&A. We haven't got an awful lot of time, so if you can make your Q questions short and punchy, and if there's a particular speaker that you would like this uh, address to, please do indicate in the chat, and we'll, we'll make sure that, uh, as far as we can, uh, is answered in the Q&A. And this event is being recorded, and there will be an edited version available afterwards uh, for, for you to share. Uh, and, and see. So uh, I don't know if uh, Rupert has joined us yet, Paul? Actually, um, no, we're going to have to move to being agile, uh, which is quite interesting given it's such a trendy topic. Uh, but no, I had a message from his office uh, to say that their offices have just been evacuated. Uh, oh. He'll join us hopefully as soon as he can and they'll keep me updated. So we just changed the speaking order and I'm glad that uh, Tony and Kate can be uh, agile too. Great, all right, then we'll, we'll move to the, the second speaker. So let me complete that introduction that Paul, Paul has indicated. So our speaker uh, first up will be Tony Reeves, and he is Chief Executive of Liverpool City Council. He was previously Chief Executive of Bradford Council from September 2006 to no November 2014. <laughs> And prior to that, Deputy Chief Executive of Wakefield City Council from March 2003 to September 2006. In 2014, Tony joined Deloitte as local government advisory partner, supporting local government in areas of strategy and policy, transformation, reorganization, health and social care integration, regeneration, economic development and housing. In 2018, Liverpool City Council appointed Tony as Chief Executive and he has worked with key partners in the city to develop the city plan and the collaborative approach to the delivery of public services and transform the outcomes for the people of the city. Now, Tony, uh, we're looking forward to Tony. Tony's extremely well qualified almost to give us this sort of local regional perspective. And in this particular uh, contribution, Tony will be uh, in, in discussion with Katie Johnson, Director of Government and Health Industries at PwC. So let me hand over to Katie and Tony, uh, over to you. Lovely, thanks Andy, and good afternoon everybody. everybody. And I'm sure it's good morning to a few of you as well. So as Andy mentioned, really delighted to be joined by Tony, who I've had the pleasure of working with for, for quite a long time now, and certainly your 40 year career, Tony, in terms of how you've shared that with us over the years, and how passionate you've been around the whole systems thinking piece. I know that you studied it over at Lancaster, very similar to myself when I studied under Mike. And we talk about regularly about that, that need for systems thinking to tackle some of those really challenging issues um, that we're facing in the public sector. And sort of just before we start, you know, Andy, just to pick up from your the capability gap piece, just to sort of make this clear, so I, I lead our public sector practice in the north. I'm of the firm believer that systems thinking should be taught to every consultant within the big four. You know, it's something that should completely be in our, you know, our armor. It should be part of our mentality of when we're helping clients to really think through those complex problems. It should almost become a sort of state of mind when we're doing that. And, you know, I'm trying to push that, that here at PwC. But I'm sure you know many will have opinions around how this is taught and you know and how people get trained in this when they you know start approaching their work in life. So, Tony, I know we were just going to just ask a few questions, just get your thoughts in relation to, to systems thinking. But maybe if we could just start off, you know, would you mind sharing with us about your learnings of systems thinking and how it's helped you to become a systemic leader? Thanks, Katie, and thank you for pointing out my 40-year career. I would say I did start at the age of three, just in case anybody's um, wondering. Um, look, I, you mentioned that as part of my MBA 
course, many, many years ago, I spent uh, an immersive fortnight with, um, with Peter Chaplin at Lancaster University. At that time, he'd published a book called Soft Systems Methodology in Action. And I, it's, not an under, it's not an overstatement to say it really changed the way I thought about the world and how things worked. And particularly because I was already working in urban regeneration, um, starting to think of cities as whole systems in their own right. And it really opened my eyes to, um, to seeing problems from a very, very different perspective. And, uh, and I think that as I've carried that with me throughout my whole career, and I'm sure we'll, we'll open up on that as we, uh, as we go through. Lovely. Thanks, Tony. And I think, you know, having worked in Liverpool and had the privilege of, of working across the, the public sector in, in Liverpool, you know, you, you're trying to do a few things differently. I think that's fair to say, you know, in terms of from other city's perspective. And I know that you're, as a chief exec of, of a city council, which has got some absolutely fabulous things going on in the, the city and the achievements over the last few years, but also recognising that there's some challenges, you know, within the city and how you, do you mind just sharing with us about sort of how have you brought some of your fellow public sector leaders around the table to think about how you're going to address those problems, which have been probably inherent for many, many years. Yeah, and I mean, if, you, if you look at the, the, um, the northern cities in the UK in particular, uh, but if you look at the core cities, the big cities outside the capital London, only one of those 10 core cities um, has a productivity level that is above the national average. When you look at countries like France and Germany and North American countries, the big cities all outperform the national average. And with their concentration of knowledge based assets, you'd expect that to be the case. But in in our northern cities with um, the um, the health um, effects of the post industrial past, um, poor education standards in, in the poorest communities, people have been trapped in poverty for, for far too long. And. Coming into the role in Liverpool, I sat down with partners, health partners, um, police, fire, housing, academia, et cetera, and um, challenged everybody to start thinking differently. And where I started from is to say, look, for the last 40 years, um, population, big populations of our city have been trapped in poverty. And there was a, there was a really, so some of you will remember in the, in, in 1980, there was a really seminal report into health inequality published uh, called the Black Report. That's subsequently been updated in, uh, by Marmot reviews over the last couple of decades. And actually nothing has changed. And I said this to my colleagues that unless we, you know, you know it's a system failure when you've got world-class clinicians working in great institutions and we still have the worst health outcomes in the country. Because it's, it isn't a health system issue, it's a much wider issue than that. And unless we do things radically differently, then people like us will be sat in a room like this in 20 years' time, talking about the next generation of the same families with exactly the same issues. So the question is, are we going to come out of our comfortable public sector silos and start taking responsibility for the whole system and securing outcomes for the city? And that really started a debate. And, and actually, um, we at the same time, Liverpool is one of the core cities, we commissioned OECD to um, carry out a review of the, the, the productivity gap between the core cities, as I mentioned earlier, and the, um, and the UK average. And one of the things that came out of that report was that um, poor levels of skills and education and poor health um, were the biggest contributors to that productivity gap. And put that into context in Liverpool, the most affluent ward in our uh, electoral ward in our city, um, Chilwell, uh, has a healthy life expectancy differential for men of 22 years over the poorest ward in the city. And the two wards are three quarters of a mile apart or a kilometre apart. Um, and that shows the impact that um, health inequality has. And so people are losing... 10 years of their working life uh, and together with having poor skills, completely trapped in poverty. So it, it isn't just enough to improve health, to impact upon an individual's quality of life. If we want to build a productive, inclusive economy so that we can secure 
um, years of growth without inflationary pressure in the system, because that's productivity does that. And I'm sure most of you recognize that we have to improve health outcomes. And that means improving housing, improving skills at the heart of this. And this is what our city plan is all about, is about giving people the power to take control of their own lives and therefore demand less public services, become more resilient and become more prosperous over time. And that requires a whole systems approach to tackling those issues. And it is my fundamental belief that if we don't do that, if we don't focus on a single set of outcomes for the place with all of the institutions um, working together to that common cause over the long run, then we will not get our poorest places out of the challenges that I've just described. Thanks, Tony. And I think the trouble sometimes coming together is, is that we're all sort of used to that siloed working with our own budgets, our own resources and, and the challenges that that presents. But things around tackling inequality, some of the mental health issues as well that you know we're facing, obesity, etc. It takes all of the system leaders to come in and have a look at those issues and trying to find solutions. You know, being honest, I'm not asking you to speak about your, your colleagues in Liverpool, but actually in terms of your wider portfolio, in terms of as a chief exec, do you sort of feel that there is a gap there, you know, in terms of system thinking capabilities? That sort of needs to be overcome by public sector leaders you know and sorry a second question as well is just you know how big do you you know do you think that is um i'm going to answer the second question first i think there's a really big gap um it's you know, there are a lot of good people about who are system leaders rather than just purely organization leaders and that is the challenge when we're facing these wicked issues or these systemic you know, systemic problems that we've we've described. But if I l- let me give you an example, um, the criminal justice system in, in the UK um, creates a, a situation where more than 50 percent of people who come out of prison reoffend and end up going back in prison. When you start to um, analyze the, the issues, there are four things that are apparent that if you can address properly, you can massively reduce the risk of people reoffending. So if people uh, have access to stable housing, if people can get into work and the time they're in prison, captive audience, pardon the pun, um, and you can start training with people, et cetera. We've got all sorts of skills gaps in the economy. If you can get a plan for the, the point when they, the point of release from the institution, and the first 24 hours, all the evidence suggests the first 24 hours is critical where things can go wrong very quickly for people. And if you make sure that there are appropriate support services um, relevant to their particular needs available, you can significantly reduce the risk of reoffending. And yes, that requires a little bit of investment, but the cost of failure in this system costs tens of, mil- tens of billions of pounds a year in the UK. And the cost of putting those things in place would be minuscule. Plus, you're creating a productive workforce. You're creating the, um, particularly with the skill shortages, so a pipeline of potential talent into um, some business sectors. Um, You're creating conditions where people will become more resilient, can take control of their own lives, et cetera. The vast majority of people don't want to reoffend and go back inside. And, And the issue is, the way the system works currently, people sit in their silos, and take control for their, for their silo, quite often protecting the leaders, protect the vested interests in those silos instead of coming together as a system and looking at that problem afresh through a range of different lenses and, um, and addressing those, those issues systemically. And actually that's work that you know, because you were involved in, a, in, in, in some of the work that we're doing um, in Liverpool, KT, we're working very, very hard on that. And I'm really confident that we can not just make a big difference, but demonstrate the benefit of system leadership in solving these problems, taking failure demand out of the system. And hopefully, with the agreement of government, allowing us to reinvest some of the resources that we save into really productive things that can build momentum in the sort of journey that we need to be on as a city. And that's only a microcosm of the, of the bigger issue. But that, that's an example for me of where decades of deficit and the inability of people to 
think and act systemically has caused th this problem. I have to say, the you know, when you look at the public sector in, in Liverpool, and it's no different to anywhere else in the country, central government hold the local state to account through 14 different sets of indicators that pull us in different directions. So we need a resolution to that. Um, I suspect it needs to be led by one or two cities working with government differently and, and, and creating a systemic approach to public sector reform. Um, government talk at the moment, high on the agenda is what they call the levelling up agenda, making sure the poorer parts of the country are brought up to the same levels of productivity and affluence as other parts of the country. Unless we systemically reform public services and tackle the issues that are the barriers to people taking control of their own lives, we don't have a cat in hell's chance of levelling up. So for me, public sector reform and inclusive economic growth are two sides of the same coin. And at the heart of this is systems thinking and systems leadership. Yeah, totally agree with that. And I think if anything over the last 18 months has taught us what we've all been through is that those barriers that are in existence or have been perceived by leaders, we were able to overcome those, to be able to all come together, to be able to say, how do we, how do we look at a problem? How do we fix it? How do we make sure that we keep everybody safe? And if we are able to sort of take those learnings, take those approaches where actually we reduce those barriers, let's not think about and worry about payment reform and et cetera, which is always the thing that comes to the forefront in relation to when you look about sort of trying to change a system. What a shame if we haven't learned from that and we're taking that forward and then in terms of sort of building um, those, those, those sort of siloed behaviours back up because the public sector coming together over the last has been absolutely fantastic. And I suppose, you know, what do you feel in that sort of 18 month period that you've sort of really learned from a, from a systems perspective in terms of things being able to be done differently from you've seen over the last 38 years? <laughs> so, so look, for, for, for me, uh, obviously, first of all, the pandemic has been um, dreadful in terms of the health impact it's had, and not Perfect. just in terms of COVID itself, but the mental health consequences for a lot of people and the legacy that's going to be living with us for years. So... But in a crisis like that, the learning uh, opportunities are absolutely massive. And, and the biggest thing for me from, from, from this is the need for bold leadership um, to not, not where you just rush into things blindly, but where you don't also try to overanalyze every situation, that you can make bold decisions, you can act and learn and keep working on the system as you're making progress. So if I give you an example of that, in uh, literally 12 months ago at, at this time, we are on the back of uh, the very pragmatic way that Liverpool um, went into what the UK government were calling tier three lockdown in order to stem rising numbers of cases in our city. We were asked, because we were very pragmatic about that, we were asked if we would pilot lateral flow testing for, for the United Kingdom. What we didn't realise, we, we, were, we were piloting lateral flow testing for the Western world. There was a huge academic debate raging about the efficacy of that, given the unproven technology. Um, I was contacted on a Sunday afternoon by government to ask, would we carry out this pilot? My answer was yes. I then spent the next three hours apologising and convincing all our public sector partners in the city it was the right thing to do. And we stood up um, lateral flow testing across a whole city of half a million people by the following Friday. The 2,000 troops on the ground working with us um, and the whole system came together. We were able to bring government and disparate government departments together to make decision making in one place. So we were all cited on what we were doing. And I think we showed incredibly bold leadership. And as a result of that, um, a direct short term result, was that Liverpool was the only city of scale in the UK that was open for Christmas, uh, or dis December for hospitality, etc. cetera, um, in the, the last Christmas, uh, which saved, because hospitality is a very big part of our economy, mm. it saved hundreds of businesses and thousands of jobs in the city and um, mitigated some of the worst economic impacts of the crisis at that time. So the thing I learned from that is that really bold leadership uh, across a system is needed 
you don't have to have a perfect plan in every situation because you're dealing with messy human situations that are evolving all the time. Um, you need a, a structured approach to your thinking, a, a systemic approach, but the ability to flex and adapt and move. But you, it, it, the key is getting people out of their silos and taking collective responsibility for the whole system. And you can move at pace and learn at pace and build that collective boldness which you, the, the key for us now is to take that forward into the other more intractable problems that we've referred to earlier and make sure we don't regress back into uh, our silos and protected vested interests and how we work going forwards. And for me, the systems thinking techniques are absolutely key to, to doing that. Lovely. Thanks ever so much, Tony, for sharing that with us. Andy, I think we've, we've come up to the end of our 20 minutes, so I'll hand back to yourself. Thank you very much, Katie and Tony. That was fascinating insight. And I think you've really set out very nicely um, some of the systemic challenges, especially around local uh, government and public health, the interconnected nature of these systemic issues and the need to think about how we transcend departmental, silo, metrics-driven ways of running things to be able to see and act more holistically and systemically. And I'm sure we're going to return to this theme and explore this throughout the conference. Um, I'd like to, to bring up to the stage our second uh, speaker, or provoca provocateur, uh, and I'd like to welcome Aku Kwame, who is a health systems researcher. So we're going to sort of develop a little bit further this uh, area around health. Her work has focused on applying complexity theory to health systems governance, management and leadership. She is particularly interested in district health systems as well as learning and mentorship, which she's been doing at the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, where she leads the Alliance's portfolios on system thinking and capacity strengthening. Aku is a next Einstein fellow, a commissioner to the WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission, looking at a future for the world's children, and a working member for another policy area, looking at children in all policies 2030. Uh, and she's also a former board member of Health Systems Global. So we can think of no better person to talk to us really about some of these systemic issues, are, in this case around health, raised up to an international level, uh, where I think we've got new sorts of complexity to, to deal with and new approaches required. So, Aku, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Andy, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for this very esteemed invitation to be a part of uh, the panel today. Uh, and to be with so many eminent speakers. I think that the conversation is going to be very rich. I'm looking forward to it. And so by way of starting, I want to first just introduce my organization to those of you who might not be familiar with the Alliance, and then also just speak briefly about how I came to systems thinking so that you can uh, understand a little bit what informs my uh, comments today. So I work with the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research. We are a hosted partnership at the WHO in Geneva, and we were established in 1997 in response to the WHO ad hoc committee on health research. And the Alliance has as its mandate to strengthen health systems in low and middle income countries through the strengthening of capacities for health policy and systems research. And so we work primarily with researchers and with policymakers in these countries. We work to, uh, to train, to generate policy relevant uh, evidence and also support both evidence uptake and policy uptake. And so while I'll be speaking today from the perspective of low and middle income countries and health system strengthening in particular, I do think that there are many things that will resonate across high income settings as well. And so in terms of my personal perspective, I came to systems thinking about 10 years ago when I was working with district health managers uh, in Ghana, which is where I'm from. And at the time I wanted to understand health managers decision space at the district level in a context where the health system is decentralized, so health authority is delegated, but for various reasons, fiscally, there's a lot of control um, and uncertainty and constraints that creates a lot of mismatches for managers. 
And so I found that concepts of complexity, complex adaptive systems, adaptive leadership, um, complexity in management, so the writings of Yul Bean, Van de Ven, Holland, uh, Stacy, I found those concepts so attractive, but they also helped me to understand the construct of district health management in Ghana um, beyond the technical and beyond the managerial to more broad uh, political, but also historical perspectives. So that's where I'm coming from. And so now to the question that I was asked to consider, what are the systems thinking capabilities needed by those seeking to improve health systems? And so I'll make three points today on what I see. Uh, first, I'll refer to the target gap. Secondly, I'll speak about the temporal gap. And then thirdly, I'll speak about the terminology gap. So first on the target gap, and this is really interesting because I noted that the organizers used the term capabilities. And I, I assume that this was deliberate, but it struck me as I was preparing uh, to speak today because what I realized is that in the field of health policy and systems research, what we refer to most frequently is strengthening capacities. And of course, we know that these are not the same, that capacities relates to what one can do. Capabilities relates to what one can do in the environment in which they find themselves. And in health system strengthening in LMICs and low and middle income countries, because we have targeted most of our interventions towards capacities and not capabilities, the target gap is that we have focused on training for systems thinking competencies while ignoring what is needed to enable systems, contexts for systems thinking. Let me share an example from our work in Ghana. So at the time we were studying a leadership development program. We were evaluating this uh, national program that sought to implicitly strengthen district manager capacities for systems thinking through a series of training workshops, uh, through work on problem identification, and then the application of tools on routine service delivery. And what we wanted to know was whether those newly learned practices were actually institutionalized, did they get sustained? And what we found was that despite the significant improvements in service delivery in the short term, so we found that there were health facilities who, based on what the managers learned, were able to improve their coverage for antenatal care. They were able to increase the numbers of women giving birth uh, in the facility as opposed to um, in the community. So really significant uh, indicators uh, of, of improving service delivery. Despite that, and the fact also that the health managers were so excited by the new practices that they learned, there was a lot of excitement around the, the novelty of new ways of thinking, new ways of being. But what we noticed is that after the passage of time, that most of the managers reverted back to their old ways of doing things. And what was critical was that while the trainings gave them new skills, gave them new competencies, the trainings did not actually address any of the contextual challenges that they faced. So the competencies and systems thinking didn't actually help them with the resource constraints that they faced, did not actually help them with the challenges in hierarchical authority, the difference between the um, authority that the district has versus the regional or the national level. And so ultimately, these district health managers found themselves with these new skills that they really valued and appreciated, but that the system that they found themselves in, in a sense, rejected. And so rejected those new competencies, even those, those, even though those competencies actually yielded results and improved service delivery. So this becomes significant because universally, most health systems behave like bureaucracies. And this flows from the fact that health systems remain dominated by clinical and biomedical perspectives on health, which tend to be reductionist and tend to privilege a certain type of evidence-based approach. But it also flows from the fact that health policymaking itself um, has a particular culture to it. And that culture remains primarily command and control. And especially in low and middle income countries, that form of command and control also has a particular uh, colonial flavor to it. So it's a particular brand of bureaucracy. 
And we know that bureaucracies don't incentivize systems thinking orientations. But it is understandable why we don't often target the context, whether that's an organizational context, whether that's a broader context, because this is too hard. It's too diffuse. It's too expensive. And oftentimes it takes too long. And so this brings me to the second point that I want to make, which is on the temporal gap. And simply put, systems thinking demands time. And in health system strengthening, oftentimes we are focused on fixing in the short term at the expense of learning in the long term. And this is not without reason. Oftentimes in health, when we look at conditions, they are perceived as being urgencies or emergencies. And I saw a comment in the chat box earlier about the description of, of health promotion. And I think that in a sense, this is something that our colleagues in health promotion have been able to understand a little bit better. It seems as though they've been able to adopt systems thinking approaches a little bit more easily. And this could be because they are able to draw on more ecological models. Um, and so make those linkages to the broader social systems as we heard uh, from Tony's thus speech. But it's also because they take a, a long term view, they think more generationally in interventions. And so they're thinking more in time and thinking more in loops. And oftentimes in health system strengthening, we don't think this way. So the temporal gap is important for two reasons. The first is that the mindset shift that is required to become proficient in systems thinking takes time. And here I'll share an example of work that we've been doing in the Alliance, where we've been working uh, in three countries, in Timor-Leste, in Pakistan, and in Botswana, supporting local research teams and district health management teams use systems thinking and reflective practice in their routine management work. And at the beginning of this work, we were thrown so many caveats. We were told that it wouldn't work in uh, Timor-Leste because the capacities were too low. It wouldn't work in Pakistan because Pakistan is very bureaucratic and the district managers have very little decision space. And when we started working with both the research teams and the district health management teams, they struggled because they were expecting us to come with a blueprint about what needs to happen. And we spent a lot of time trying to just figure out what were their needs, what were their priorities, what were their preoccupations that systems thinking could help them work with. And I think at the beginning, they, they thought maybe we didn't really know what we were doing because we took a long time to really try to understand the system from their perspective. But what was interesting was that after they had been through a few cycles of reflective practice, after they had been exposed to the utility of the systems thinking tools, we saw them adopting these tools in their COVID responses. So we saw in Pakistan that the district health teams began using process mapping for their contact tracing. In Timor-Leste, we saw that systems thinking approaches were being used to consider the vaccination rollout. But all of this is to say that this has taken two years. It's taken two years, a lot of time exchanging with the teams, doing a lot of peer country to country learning and a lot of um, time spent with the, the technical systems thinking experts really accompanying the local teams and the district teams. So systems thinking confidence takes time. But the second point that I want to make about the temporal gap is that in health system strengthening, oftentimes we don't take the longer term scope and view, and therefore we miss measuring how the system is adapting after the introduction of an intervention. So oftentimes we don't actually measure in the medium term or in the long term. We measure in the short term without realizing that the system is changing and what we've measured at the short term is not necessarily what we ought to be looking at in the medium or in the long term. And again, if I use the example from Ghana, what we saw was that if we had just stuck with our short term measures, then we would have evaluated the program to be a success based on the service delivery outcomes and how they had improved. But as we measured over the medium term and the long term, we had to conclude that the program wasn't as successful as we thought because it was not sustained, it was not institutionalized. However, in the context of low and middle income countries, I do want to emphasize that the challenge that is posed by focusing on the short term and not the long term is directly as a function of how a lot of systems strengthening interventions are funded. 
And so a lot of international donor funds are rarely long-term. They are usually earmarked and they're often non-adaptive. And the accountabilities that come with them actually perpetuate that hierarchical authority. And so it gives a, an audit mentality or a reporting mentality that really runs counter to enabling systems thinking. And then let me come to my third point, which is about the terminology gap. And certainly in low and middle income countries, we, have, we still see very few examples of documented applied systems thinking, particularly in policymaking and in practice. And what we've observed is that this arises as a result of an imprecision in terminology, that oftentimes we have conflated what we meant when we have been speaking about health systems approach, we've been speaking about the six components of a health system, the six building blocks. What we've not been speaking about is how do we use systems theory to design or to monitor and evaluate our interventions. And so this imprecision in language has um, given the consensus, everyone agrees that health systems are complex, but we have missed out on the proof of concept that systems thinking has any analytic power in health policy making and in practice. And so there has been as a result of this a limited or a perhaps linear theorizing of what a given intervention can do. But also we have a lack of evidence on the actual impacts of systems thinking. In terms of the, ter the terminology gap, we also face this long-standing tension of how we refer to systems thinking, whether we are referring to the philosophical approach of systems thinking, or whether we're talking about the tools and the methods. And in health system strengthening, the tools that we have tended to use have been process mapping, um, system dynamic modeling, causal looping, sometimes social network analysis, but again, this denotes a, a more positivist perspective on systems analysis, where the systems uh, of health system strengthening may benefit from more ecological and perhaps less machine driven metaphors. And then the final point I want to make about the terminology gap, something that we've been hearing more recently, we are uh, in the midst of developing a global community of practice around applied systems thinking for health policy and systems research. And one of the questions that is arising is whether the concepts of systems thinking um, translate in various regions of the globe. Does systems thinking conceptually need to be localized? In other words, are there certain cultural or certain religious perspectives on complexity that give rise to different understandings of systems thinking? And we've been hearing this particularly from our colleagues in Asia, and we're just at the beginning of exploring these, these questions. So in closing, the systems thinking capabilities and health system strengthening, in my view, have been hindered by three gaps that have constrained more widespread systems thinking in health systems. The first is the target gap. We've been targeting systems thinking competencies rather than enabling contexts for systems thinking. Number two is the temporal gap. We have been focused on the short term rather than enabling long-term learning. And then number three, the terminology gap, which is that we've not been specific enough in our language when referring to systems thinking. So just by way of closing, I wanted to comment that I really loved the picture that the organizers use of this man on a tightrope trying to balance his way across. And as I looked at that picture, the question that came to me is that, is there a safety net that is going to catch him? And my assumption is, is that today we're uh, assuming that that safety net is in fact systems thinking. And so I'm looking very much forward to hearing the comments coming from the other speakers. So with that, Andy, I'll thank you very much and turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Aku. That was a, a superb presentation. And I, I, I think you've shone a light on some of the many structural challenges around the, the theory and ideas of systems thinking and how you bring it practically to bear in different contexts uh, and possible, as you, as you said, with different uh, cultures and religious um, contexts are, are also super uh, important. And this bringing to, uh, 
distinguishing between the the target gaps, as you said, um, that well, the target gap, the temporal gap, and the terminology gap. I think those are great lenses to to get into some of the challenges of how we make this systems thinking live and breathe more widely. Um, so thanks ever so much for that. Uh, I'm just double checking whether our uh, our, our speaker Rupert has appeared. Um, Paul, are you able to give us an update on that? Yeah, and he hasn't at the moment. He's hoping that he's going to be able to get in by three o'clock. So what I propose is um, that if it makes sense, um, I think if you kind of introduce the system thinkers and if we can maybe have some comments from them on what they've heard so far, I'll keep an eye out for Rupert uh, joining and then I'll send. I'll, I'll interrupt and then let you know what, um, when he's arrived. Right. Okay. And so we'll move into the responders, uh, I think, and who are all systems thinkers in their own right who've been listening acutely to this. I think, uh, Paul, when when Rupert arrives, we can uh, pause and switch back to Rupert to com uh, to complete this. We're going to have to be agile about this, but uh, we uh, understand his challenge. <laughs> It is, if his office was evacuated, I guess he maybe doesn't know exactly when he's going to be able to get back in, but he's hoping by three. Yes. Okay, well, we've already, I think, got a, a fantastic picture from both um, Tony and Aku of uh, some of the some of the, the challenges, but also some of the progress that's being made in applying some of the principles of systems thinking into particular contexts. Um, Tony's outlined the importance and, and the value he's bringing to encouraging Liverpool to think about the city as a system and the challenges of trying to reverse engineering the more machine-based and metaphors and siloed structures and legacy ways of thinking that make unpacking that and reassembling that in a, in a whole sense approach a challenge and he's, he's making good progress on that and Akko's expanded that to, to look at the importance of both being able to distribute this thinking locally into different environments but it's the importance of context uh, you made a, a, I think a great distinction between uh, uh, capacities, the, the ability to know how to approach systems thinking from a theoretical level to the capabilities, which you rightly pointed out is uh, deliberately put there to recognize it. The context plays a hugely important role in determining uh, how we take some of this theory and turn it into practice. Uh, and it was very interesting you, you were sharing the degree to which the context can, even if you've landed it well, can exert its forces and shape it and pull it back to previous modes. So it's not just understanding, deploying, it's sustaining over time. And, and the, the, the knowledge of context is, is incredibly important. So we've got um, three systems thinkers who are gonna respond to what they've heard. Um, I'd like to call up first uh, Ray Eisen. Now Ray is a professor of systems at the Open University. He's also engaged in research and systemic inquiry in South Africa, China, and Australia. So he's got a, a broad international perspective on this as well. Uh, Ray developed and sustained his systemic sensibilities growing up in rural North South Wales, Australia. So he's, he's got a, a, a perspective drawn from those roots, which would be interesting to, to hear from. And he states that systems thinking in practice begins with the realization we act out of our own traditions of understanding, inviting other perspectives and finding ways to organize our own thinking so that what we do has a chance of being systemically desirable and culturally feasible. And I think that resonates quite well with what Aku was saying. So Ray has employed systems thinking in a range of research and consultancy fields and has co-designed the learning systems in systems thinking in practice for which the Open University has become internationally recognized. So I can't think of a better person to kick us off in response to what we've heard. Ray, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. And uh, thank you, uh, Tony and Aku, for those very um, insightful earlier presentations. Um, I want to start by uh, uh, 
claiming responsibility for what I say and giving honour to the claim I've just heard Andy make on my behalf, that we all think and act out of our own traditions of understanding. And I do that and take responsibility for that. And my tradition will be different to yours, but there'll be many uh, very capable systems thinkers in this audience, and we'll hear from many of them. But um, one of the things we've learned from 50 years of systems education at the Open University is that the young human really is born with a, what I will call an innate systemic sensibility. But much of our culture drives that sensibility out of us. And one of our great challenges in terms of addressing this capability gap that we're talking about is how one builds uh, institutional arrangements and uh, situations where we can regain our systemic sensibilities. We then talk about how you build systems literacy on the top of systemic sensibilities and how you can build that into capabilities. And I particularly liked, Aku, your distinction between capacity and capabilities. Uh, as that is something that's informed how we design our educational systems at the Open University. When I uh, first arrived there some years ago now uh, from Australia in the UK and began to become familiar with our mature age students, I realized that uh, as enthusiastic as our students were and doing great things, often we were also potentially setting our students up to fail because they often went back enthusiastic about the ideas we taught in our programs, but found uh, hostility, um, indifference, and other things in the organizational context to which they returned. And I felt we were being unethical if we didn't take count of not only how you equipped people with what you would call um, capacities, but what we now call uh, equipping students to take uh, a design turn and a design turn in the, in the way we use it is to be able to think about the contexts in which they're going to do their practice and to begin to think about how they co-evolve or co-adapt with their contextual circumstances. And so this is a meta form of practice to go carry along with your own practice. And so I agree with your analysis uh, wholeheartedly uh, and urge um, all uh, educators not to stop at simplistic uh, training. Training out of context often fails to take into account the complexities of a situation, which allows me to pick up on one point that hasn't been made yet. And that is, uh, uh, and it links with your issue about um, terminology and terminology uh, use, uh, my preference is always to start with a conversation about a situation and to acknowledge that all of our practice is embodied. We are practitioners and that the key to systems thinking is the in practice part by an embodied practitioner. And uh, one of the reasons for doing that is that it leaves open then the possibility of how you engage with situations and how you choose to frame those situations and it doesn't seduce you into thinking that there is already a system present in the situation. Many of our failures are because there isn't a system in the situation. And if I can just uh, say, draw on experiences from Australia where I am at the moment, uh, if you take the national government in response to COVID, uh, one of their responses was to create a national cabinet a new type of organization where the uh, premiers of different states, the federal government and health uh, expert, experts came together in the face of uncertainty and complexity and admitted they didn't know what to do. And they created a national cabinet that learned its way into an unfolding situation. And the family therapists, the systemic family therapists have a, con a concept that describes what they actually did. And this is called, they created a problem determined system. They were in, engaging with a situation which was problematic and they developed a system around that to try and do something about it. And that meant that everyone in that exercise was open to learning. And I thought that that was exactly what Tony was describing when he talked about his experiences with lateral flow work in Liverpool. 
So if one is open to the situation, one doesn't get stuck with the defense of one's silos or the defense of one's ideological position or the pursuit of, of uh, political power at the expense of uh, effective governance. Unfortunately, the National Cabinet in Australia didn't function very long in, these, in this mode. And it very quickly flipped back to what the family therapist would call a system determined problem. Most people spent the time trying to conserve the system of which they were a part and the privileges or the ideology of those components. So my story, I hope, illustrates that uh, how you take concepts, how you put them into action uh, is important. It's why we need a much more literate uh, community working in public policy in these areas, able to draw on systems concepts, ways of thinking, ways of engaging, as well as methods and tools and techniques. And, and they need to be, um, in a sense, uh, a type of choreographer, in my view, where they orchestrate effective performances in those unfolding and changing uh, circumstances. Now, Andy, I'm uh, not keeping the eye on time, so you must tell me if I've got a few minutes left or when you want me to uh, finish up, please. Yeah, yeah, you've got a couple minutes, a few minutes left if there's okay. something Good. you would like to add, yeah. Um, I just want to go back to the idea about um, what I call systemic sensibility. And, and in my own work, we've formed a, uh, or articulated a theory of change, which we think um, people engaged in or being educated in systems thinking uh, would do well to take on board, and, and I guess people in organizations and public policy. Uh, you, in introducing things, Paul and Andy, you talked about COP. Well, we cannot not escape the um, breakdown in connectivity or relationship between humans and the biosphere. That's what COP26 is all about. And so any theory of change that doesn't have central to it, our human relationship to the biosphere is not an adequate theory of change. Furthermore, we humans have invented the, what some people now call the technosphere. The technosphere is all of that human invented stuff, cement, bitumen, materials, which are, we have littered the uh, earth with, a biomass almost as great as the earth has uh, in, uh, created itself. And we are responsible for that technosphere and that unfolding technosphere. So we cannot escape the systemic implications of the biosphere, technosphere relationships. Now within that, we have to, uh, I would contend, be able to recover our ability to think and engage with these situations in ways that foster relationship, systemic relationships. And we, uh, in our educational programs, make a distinction between systemic as relational, recursive, circular thinking, and systematic thinking, which is the dominant paradigm of linear cause and effect, command and control, power over uh, types of uh, thinking. Now, there are certainly circumstances where systematic thinking is useful, but it is used in 99% of cases uh, where it is not useful because it starts out doing uh, things in the wrong way. And so I would really urge um, if I can finish with a, just a couple of urgings and encouragements. We're celebrating 50 years of systems education at the Open University. We've um, outlasted many uh, people who've uh, been in this space. But can I make a, a, a plea for a, a much greater investment, not only in universities, but particularly in universities, uh, in uh, organizations, in think tanks, but in, above all, in developing a greater literacy and capability uh, across um, our societies. And in that regard, I'm pleased uh, that one of the speakers who will follow me is Patrick Hoverstadt, who spent a lot of effort uh, working with employers uh, to develop a new um, systems thinking practitioner apprenticeship in, the, in England, 
which uh, is one of the very first uh, efforts internationally to professionalize the systems thinking practitioner. Uh, apart from systems engineers who have uh, also got their own apprenticeship. But I think the, the roles of the systems engineer and a systems thinking practitioner are somewhat different. Uh, and I would encourage any employer who's in this audience and living in England to think about uh, recruiting systems thinking practitioner apprentices, because it's a master's level apprenticeship. I'll stop there. Thanks, Andy. No, thank you very much for that, Ray. That was uh, really, valuable contribution i think um you brought in some new points there that i, th I think are, are incredibly important the idea of thinking through the situation um at a, at a human level I, I guess so that any subsequent solution can be situated in the context of that situation not be abstracted to a level where it's hard to embody it as you say and i think this point that you made also about the relationship to the biosphere uh, it brought to mind a kind of relationship between humanity <laughs> nature and the biosphere and technology and that our relationship with ourselves and, and in terms of our quality of life and our health and our societies is important our relationship to the planet is increasingly being called to the surface as something we need to recognize but our relationship with technology in the technosphere as you said uh, is a little bit of a curveball because technology is developing exponentially. And how do we accommodate or harness the exponential power of technology to support both humanity and our relationship with nature? How do we sort of harness that and bring that into that greater relationship you talked about? So super important uh, points there. And you nicely set me up for introducing our second responder, uh, Patrick Hoverstar. Uh, thanks, Andy over decades of trying to address health inequalities because we don't we don't tackle the system that drives those health inequalities simply trying to mess around with the with the symptoms rather than the systemic causes gets us absolutely nowhere you kind of have to decommission the system that's creating the the effect uh, if you want to change the effect um Really liked your, your 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 three things breakdown, Aku. I thought that was that was really really helpful, and I, I, I'm I'll try and pick some of those up um, in response, um, not necessarily in, in necessarily in the right order. I mean, I think I think one of the huge there's two huge things that's changed for us now, and partly I guess this is the reason we're having this this conversation now. One is that the nature of the world has kind of changed. So once upon a time, well, for most of history, it was, it was perfectly possible to run public policy and do what we did in a linear kind of way, because mostly stuff didn't come back to us. And now the thing that has fundamentally changed is the world has closed and you can no longer work in a, line, in a purely linear way. Virtually everything you do is going to come back to you. Um, so just an example, I was, I was talking to a government agency about this the other day, you know, um, Britain's fought four wars in Afghanistan and for the first three, there was virtually no chance that, um, you know, somebody was going to come back from Afghanistan to the UK and kill people here. Now it's almost certain they will. You cannot act in the world anymore in the way we used to. And there's, there's, that means that we have to sort of deal with these things in a fundamentally different way. COVID that Tony referenced has been, you know, a not totally unmitigated disaster, but a disaster nonetheless. I think the mitigation is that it has opened up a lot of eyes to the possibility of doing things differently. I think it's, it has created a space of, you know what, all those things we said we couldn't do, some of them we can do. Uh, and I think it's, it's a that and the financial crash of 2008 are fantastic opportunities to say, you know what, it can be different. And I think, I think there is a massive opportunity for us there. Um, so I just want to pick up on, on, on some of Akko's provocations, which, which, which I really, really liked. The, I think systems thinking and practice, um, and you talked about the, the problems of, of, the, of the stickiness in a sense of that, as did Tony, actually. Uh, and I think 
I think this is this is a an easy one and a difficult one at the same time. Systems systems practice has a number of methodologies that deal with loads of different things. So different aspects of what we're trying to deal with. So part of your thing um, in your target part of your talk, Aku, is have we got tools that address different aspects of this? Have we got approaches in systems that deal with hierarchy and power imbalances and all? And the answer is yes. Um, the difficulty is that any individual might need to deploy several of them, which means they might need to know how to deploy several of them. And historically, as systems practitioners, we haven't been good at that. So historically, the, the systems world was populated by people who were basically one trick ponies. And it's to Mike's, Mike Jackson's and Ray's um, credit enormously that they have really led the charge certainly in the UK and I think worldwide actually on tackling things in a multidisciplinary way and I think that's been you know it's only it's only relatively recently the systems community has stopped throwing rocks at one another um, and I think now there is an opportunity to, to actually pull this together as, as a kind of more coherent field um, which we are doing so one of the things Andy didn't mention is that I, I head the professional body for systems practice we have a competency framework on which the apprenticeship that ray ray was mentioning is based and it has in it a dozen different you know fairly complete systems methodologies which are techniques that you can learn and you can and they, they apply you know to different as different sorts of systems problems so there is a really quite rich systems toolkit there but below that, of course, is systems thinking. So systems thinking is something much more fundamental. It is actually different ways of thinking. You can be a systems practitioner and use a systems approach without actually being a systems thinker. And of course, we've got systems approaches that are designed for the sorts of problems that, that, that have been faced in the past. And going forward, we're going to need different ones. And that actually does require systems thinking. I'm, I'm, I always go back to a... I'm quite a big Bucky Fuller fan, you know, but Mr. Fuller, the geodesic domes guy. And he, he's one of his sayings was that it is easier to act your way into a different way of thinking than it is to think your way into a different way of acting. And I think they traditionally we've, we've really shot ourselves in the foot that systems thinking has been taught as theory to practice when between 75 and 95 percent of the population do not learn that way round. They learn from practice to thinking. And I think reversing that has a dramatic effect. When I first started practicing 25 years ago, one of the things that I use a lot because I'm interested in organizations is the viable system model, which is a systems approach to doing that. And the conventional wisdom at the time was that it was too complicated for anybody to learn. And now, I mean, that hasn't been the case for 15 years. You know. When I started, if I walked into a boardroom and talked about BSM, people looked at me like I got the wrong number of heads. That no longer happens. You know, you can, you, we, we can, we can train people at all levels of an organisation in BSM, and they get it, and they get it because you do it from practice to theory. It, you know, there is just pedagogical technique there that 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 works, and we can we can use. So I think there's, there's, there's tricks that we can, we can learn about making this easier to get and stickier and doing the dissemination much more easily and faster. And I think that, that, that's, that's great. One of the things that you talked about, Aku, where we have been absolutely rubbish, I think, is, is evidencing it. So systems thinkers by nature tend to like, like the ideas and the ideas enough. Um, but it isn't for pragmatic people in serious positions who have to take life and death decisions based on advice that they might get from a systems thinker. They want evidence. And we have not been great at that. I think that's that's been a massive lack and is going to be a difficult one for us to backfill, to be honest. Um, but it, I think it's absolutely critical that we do it. Um, I really like your temporal thing. and. Um, I think one of the one of the great things about well a couple of the great things about systems is that 
um, systems approaches will always give you an alternative to conventional approaches. They may give you the right alternative, but they always give you an alternative. Um, one of the things about them that I really, really like is that, okay, they can't, some of them, sometimes they can be slow, but sometimes they can be blisteringly quick. So systems approaches, when they work well, can work an awful lot faster than anything else. Um, that can itself be a handicap because they can work so fast that people don't actually realize you've done anything when you've done it, you know? Um, and again, this I think goes back to the take up problem. And I'll, I'll, if I may, I'll, I'll just indulge in, in two dead, dead quick stories, one a success and one a disaster. Um, so the success one was I got asked into a UK agency, a few billion dollar, few billion pounds turnover, and they they wanted some help redesigning the governance structure. And they said, can you do a feasibility? We can pay for a, a week's work to do a feasibility study without going out to tender. Could you do a fee? You know, could you do a scoping exercise, and then we'll put it out to one of the big four to do the real work. And uh, apologies for this, Katie. And um, so we had a week to do a scoping exercise and we completely redesigned the governance structure and got it passed by the board and got it passed by two ministries in a week. Now that's, you know, that's the, the, the speed it can work at. That's a, that's a success story. And, and instead of spending, you know, a third of a million quid and taking six months to do it, it, it was all done and dusted in a week. The, 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 the not so good story was a systems um, intervention in um, strengthening health systems in the third world, in Africa, actually, well, Africa and the Indian subcontinent, for a development charity. And again, we were asked to do some viable systems modelling work on how that, you know, which parts of the health system would be good to do an intervention in. And the results were quite quick and um, very, very clear and utterly rejected because it wasn't the answer that they wanted. And it challenged the way they have been doing health systems interventions forever. Um, and the fact that it was quick really, really didn't help because, you know, quick means superficial, doesn't it? You know? Um, so I think this, this all, to some extent, goes back to the techniques around how you work in context and the ground, the, the, the fertility of the ground that you're sowing seeds in, um, where, that's, where, where that's receptive, then it's very easy to get traction and where it's not, it really, really fundamentally isn't. Um, so I think that's a, that's a progressive thing though, that does get easier through time. Um, my experience over too long really, quarter of a century, is this is one hell of a lot easier than it used to be. How am I doing for time, Andy? I think we're just running up against the end of time now. Is there? Um, well, I think that'll point? probably do, won't it? Yeah, I think that that's those are really good points there, and it's great, Patrick, you're able to give us some examples of practically how systems thinking approaches are indeed able to make a, a difference uh, at some pace if in in the right context and uh, and in the right way, and this issue. Uh, I think that you raise, which is critical to the critical systems forum and the work that we're uh, doing with Mike is, is that there are a, a range of different tools and techniques. So having that sort of portfolio of approaches and being able to diagnose and understand what is the most appropriate of, of the tools and techniques to, to, to help us with particular solutions is definitely uh, something to, to, to look forward to. And I think also this Bucky Fuller point about uh, uh, from practice to theory, I think is a point well made that we there's a risk that we're trying to impose theory on on the real world, uh, which may benefit from a different reversing that order. So I think there's a great points to share. Um, I will now move over to our final responder, um, and that's uh, Jean Bolton. And. Uh, Jean is Managing Director at Claremont Management Consultants Limited, as well as Visiting Senior Research Fellow at the University of Bath, Department of Social and Policy Sciences. And as you can see there, Jean writes, the world is, seems ever more interconnected, fast-changing, uncertain, volatile, and emergent. 
I think the first and foremost complexity thinking wobbles the implicit mechanical worldview that things are largely predictable and success resides in clarity, planning and evidence. Uh, exploring complexity and systems theory helps to shape our approach to strategy to show how we explore the context in which and with which organize, operate and our theories of change and leadership. So I think Jean is, uh, is gonna provide a, a very sort of valuable and insightful uh, perspective on some of the themes that uh, are arising in this conversation. So I'll hand over to you, Jean. Sorry, I just realized I, uh, I was still muted. So um, good afternoon, ah. everybody. Um, lovely to be here. Um, I, um, I'm, it's, it's interesting, I'm positioning myself, I notice, uh, in slightly differently. So I'm a, a scientist by background. I've worked a, a lot of my life, though, in, in the field of, of management, and um, I'm a, a now a visiting fellow at Cranfield School of Management, as well as with Bath. I teach in South Africa at the University of Cape Town. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of what it means to say the world is complex. So before we get on, as, as, as others have said, before we get on to methods, it's, it's like, what, what can we know about the complex world? How can we then find methods of, of learning about it, methods of managing it, methods of thinking about it that resonate with what it means to say the world is complex? Um, and I, I, I suppose my starting point is to say it, complexity doesn't mean that things are messy uncertain and, and interconnected and it's awful so there's there's a way in which we can position complexity as bad as something that we have to kind of handle and manage because it's um you know it's a bad thing and we have to remember that complexity is the source of um innovation novelty um resilience adaptability so so something about about um, as as the book um I, I'll just ruthlessly um, put, put that one up, the, the book Embracing Complexity. There's something about embracing the nature of the complex world as, as opposed to thinking about it as something that, that gets in the way and we have to be worried about or scared about and perhaps manage. So that's the first thing I want to say. And it's a kind of worldview issue. Um, and uh, what I'd like to, to offer is the idea that the, the worldview that comes from complexity thinking, and these things overlap with systems thinking. I'm not trying to make a claim for something that's, um, that's, that's uniquely different. But one part of it is, is the idea that the world actually settles in self-sustaining patterns. So it's, it's a little bit raised point about start with the situation don't impose the idea that there might be a system there. What, what does that mean? You know, sometimes uh, we, we can look at ecological systems or situations. We might be looking at, at, at Liverpool, we might be looking at, uh, at something on a larger scale, but we don't have to know everything about everything in order to act because things settle into relatively stable patternings. And those patternings, um, of norms of behavior of cultures or ecological patterns um, are historically uncontextually driven. So if I'm working in Liverpool as opposed to, to Bradford, then understanding where, that, where things have come from, what's the history, how deeply embedded are some of those patterns of behavior, what are the resources, how does the power sector work, what is the role of the private sector in Liverpool as opposed to Bradford, let's say, what, what, what non-for-profits organizations are there. It's understanding that, that, that whole context, but understanding it in terms of relatively stable patterns. We're not having to look at everything that's there in order to start to think about how to harness resources, how to act where there might be some opportunities. So I thought that the, the talk um, that, that, that Tony and Katie gave and, and also Aku, um, sometimes in, in making these kind of um, contributions, I feel, I feel the need to come up with lots of, of examples, but those examples were very much um, in line. Um, you know, it was hard not to violently agree with everything that was said, uh, to be honest, um, really lovely uh, presentations. So that's one thing I, I wanted to, to bring in, this, this idea that we, we have to spend time looking at the patternings that are there. And they're not always there because there are times when things are chaotic. And there are other times when things are very tightly locked in. 
um, and uh, you know, and our, our job is not to strengthen, but actually to try and disrupt and break some of the the very you know locked in power structures and uh, limits to to what can be done. The the thing that I think complexity thinking. Um, draws out it is within systems thinking but it draws out a bit more clearly I think in, in relation to the patternings is the dynamic of change it's it's the the idea that that it is the complex interweaving world that both results in in the the, the emerging stabilizing and ultimate dissolving of patterns so we need to be interested in um, the small emerging shoots of change, the small qualitative differences um, that, that might create the opportunities for doing something different. And I think that when we talk about thinking or systems thinking, we're still playing with, with this idea that, that it's kind of about thinking. Of course, we need to think systemically. Um, we need to, we need to recognise, as, as has been said, that, that, that actually thinking systemically isn't the same as thinking that there are systems and going out to find them. So, so it, that's a subtle difference as well. But it's also a practice of how do we build in practices and get people attuned to the idea that we have to notice um, opportunities, we have to notice things unravelling, we have to notice that kind of qualitative change and be prepared to kind of respond to that before things are so certain that it's too late. So it's it, it's interesting, isn't it, that the, the, the scientists are trying to say to the, um, the government at the moment, you know, if, if you're going to if you're going to respond to COVID, um, it, it's exponential, guys. You know, you have to kind of do something here. You can't wait till you're sure because it's too late. So there's something about thinking exponentially that comes into this. But there's also something about do we ask people what's new, what's different, what's changing? Do we have practices that draw out? Are we willing to work with multiple perspectives? Um, do we use what does it mean to use judgment? Um, and how do how do we, um, in a, in a critical subjective way, draw in many perspectives and, and information, qualitative, quantitative information, to say a bit a bit like Tony did. You know, yeah, we're going to go with this lateral flow testing. It's a good opportunity. I can see this working here. I'm doing it now. There's something about about the the speed of picking up opportunities. And the kind of grant that the, the fact that that what is an opportunity in one city or one country won't be an opportunity somewhere else. So how do we attune ourselves to the situation and get used to this idea that however much we think about the future, however much we use um, really good systemic methods, the future will emerge um, in some cases in ways that we can't have predicted. And how do we spot that early? so that we can really adapt well to, to that change. So I think in terms of capacity building um, and capability building, and then attuning people to that idea, we have to find ways of, of um, informing ourselves and noticing emerging change, uh, I think is, is an important part of that. People used to talk about managing by uh, walking about, and it's a kind of global, it's a bigger version of that. You know, it wasn't impossible for the economists to notice that um, that the pandemic might be the biggest thing that happens to the economy. Um, the pandemic was was a an, a known unknown. Um, but if you don't, if you think within your silos, you're not going to to notice those those kind of issues come coming on. So the the final thing I wanted to say, um, and and I've I was thinking I'd I'd like to respond to the to the talks more, but I just agree with them. So uh, there's been very little that 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 I wouldn't say that was great. What I think I'm trying to add is that if we bother to look at theory or the the world view that comes out of 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 the science of complexity, then it helps to give us courage to do some of the things that Aku and, and Tony were talking about. It makes sense if we understand what it, what it means to interrogate the nature of the complex world. So the final point I wanted to make was, was um, does that, is anybody old enough to remember process re-engineering that, um, that was very popular at one time? There's, some, there's something about if we start with the nature of the complex world and the kind of patterning and opportunities and qualities that are in the situation that we're there, then we need to 
make sure that the, the processes of management, the processes of engagement, the processes of, of understanding reflect the nature of the complex world in the situation that we're in. And one of the issues about silos is it's, it's not just enough to get the silos to talk to each other. We have to have a structure that is, is siloed in the opposite direction that goes with the process as opposed to with these kind of um, disciplines. So I think, I think that's something to think about as well, because I think it can give people the confidence that we need to manage with principles. We need to give more um, opportunity for people to respond to their local situations and local contexts, but we can still tighten up on, on budgets and accountability and not frighten people that it's all going to get terribly uh, loose by just changing how you define the budgets. Some, some of the um, international development funders are funding more systemically and more longer term. They're not just saying do what you like. Um, they're asking for evidence, but they're, they're, they're not funding in this same kind of siloed, short term, very target driven way. So I hope that's helpful. It's very nice to, uh, to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I think that's all I've got to say. Thanks very much, Jean. That was uh, that was great. You, you give us a, something else to chew on there. And I think you're uh, highlighting that complexity is not something necessarily to be feared and seen as a problem. It is the natural flow and order of things. And what we're looking at is recognizing that and harnessing and seeing how complexity manifests itself, whether it is indeed patterned or chaotic or or the consequence of locked in structures and being able to discern and approach on that basis, as you say, so it's a world view. Um, so that was really, really great. So that's, I think that's given us another set of lenses from which to, to look at, the, at this discussion. Uh, I've heard from Paul, uh, unless Paul, do you want to give this update on Rupert? Well, yes, unfortunately, uh, uh, well, I've been having a running conversation with Rupert um, and he's not going to be able to join us because they're not allowing him back into the office. Uh, apparently, they're locked out for security reasons, um, so he's not going to be able to rejoin us, which in a way uh, is, well, a bad thing, but we'll try, I think, and uh, get a recording, an interview with him uh, on the thoughts we're discussing today after the event, and I'm sure he's going to be up for doing that. Uh, the good point about it is that um, it gives us an extra 10 minutes on our schedule for a bit more Q&A, which makes uh, the whole event a bit more interactive. Uh, so I think, uh, Andy, if you can uh, well, move straight to the, the, the Q&A session, after the Q&A, we'll, um, then we'll get Mike's uh, reflections on everything that um, he's heard so far and uh, uh, we'll also move into um, afterwards the what well, we're going to do kind of an optional session of breakouts at the end uh, so we may have more time for that it depends how long the Q&A uh, will go on for but and did you want to just move to introduce yeah. the Q&A? Yes um, so now we can sort of take a step back and sort of look at the, the landscape we've covered, which has been very rich and, and, and very complete, I think. Um, so I'll, I'll kick off with one question and uh, please do uh, post your questions in the chat because this is an opportunity that we rarely get to get so many great thinkers in one place ready to answer your questions. So don't uh, miss out on this. Um, but I, th I thought I'd just kick off by saying, just picking up on some of the themes that came back from the responders, really, I think particularly Jean and, uh, and Ray mentioned this, that if complexity and sort of emerging change is experienced at the, at the, at the leading edge, if you like, at the front line where, where, where we experience reality, how good we are at noticing and understanding what's going on drawing that insights up into our institutional structures to be able to see what's going on and what's called for is speaks more to the, the importance of this kind of bottom-up approach to understanding what's emerging what's changing being able to adapt to that uh, which runs counter to the top-down heavily abstracted 
siloed structures around which most of our institutions have historically been uh, developed. How, how do we bring that different perspective to bear? Because there's a lot invested in our old structures. Uh, I just wondered whether anyone had some thoughts and ideas of uh, how we get to tackle some of the, these, these challenges. Ray, do you want to go? Uh, yes, I'm happy. That's a, that's a topic dear to my heart, um, having written uh, and worked quite a lot on governance and governance failure. Um, I might, I might start, say I start with my experience growing up on a farm in rural New South Wales. Uh, if you weren't open to your circumstances and the reading of the environment and the landscape, then you weren't a very viable or long-term farmer because you just didn't co-evolve with the changing circumstances that you found yourselves in. So the notion of co-evolving is a really important one at uh, both a local level in, a, in relationship to the biophysical world, but it's ultimately a very important one at the level of government. I would claim that the Westminster system of government is no longer fit for purpose. Why is it no longer fit for purpose? Because it has power and decision-making flowing up to the minister who doesn't have the variety to manage all the variety that's necessary to be managed. Uh, and those who are at the um, local context, who are open to circumstances, able to read the landscape, make relationships with people who could be really powerful people in co-design, uh, self-organizing, localized uh, initiatives, are uh, exempt from engaging in um, effective governance because they are cut out of the governance system too often. And even local government operates too much too often with command and control rather than uh, uh, more self-organizing uh, localized action. So this is a, this is a phenomenon of, of our command and control world and it's a problem of the institutional designs that create that create um, the circumstances in which we live. Does anyone else want to have a, a, a crack at this particular question? Patrick. Well, I, I mean, just a quickie really that, I mean, again, like Ray do quite a bit of work on, on governance and um, this always comes up, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of over centralization. And I mean, it, it's quite sort of, in a way, quite painstaking because you got, you know, when we tackle it, we have to tackle it on a case by case basis. But it usually works um, that if you simply do the hard work of saying, right, so this is the number of decisions that you need, you know, if you structure it like this, this is the number of decisions that you're going to have to take. The decisions look like this. How long are you going to meet to take them? I mean, just basically do the maths of how many decisions, how complex, what information do you need? Are you actually going to be able to take those decisions well? And, every, and it, invariably, people realise that that's a non-starter and start to develop. And sometimes that the the you know under that pressure, when they're actually confronted with the reality of what they're not able to do, you can get them to devolve decision making four, five, six levels. Um, but it, you know you just you, you've got to go through it. You know. You've got to go through it. I mean, people are not, if you treat them like grown-ups, quite often, I mean, not always, but quite often they will respond like grown-ups, you know, yeah. and, and um, just just do the work. I, I, I have a perspective on this, if it's of, of any use, from yes. a practical point of view. I'm, when, when I talked um, earlier about um, people taking control of their own lives, you can't do that by telling people what they should be doing. Um, and, and this implies a fundamentally different role for the state of instead of sitting in our silos and paternalistically doing things to people, it's about the role of the state at a local level, getting alongside um, families, getting alongside communities and assisting them in securing their own well-being. That implies a power shift. And you need to do that at a neighborhood level. If we're going to tack, if we're going to tackle the systemic issues that are holding communities and holding individuals and families back, we need to do that in their places with them, 
and we need to create the conditions for them to build their social capital and their power and their ability to influence their lives and the environment they're operating in. So you have to do that at a neighborhood level uh, and at a, or, or at the level that works for the people that are part of that system, rather than the, the level that works efficiently for institutions who in the past have always known best and know what, what needs to be done. The problem is silo paternalism just bakes in dependency, bakes in poverty and traps people in the situation that they're in. So that's why I talk about a radical approach to remodeling people, re remodeling public services. At the, at the heart of that is a fundamentally different relationship between citizens and the state. And it's not the citizens that need to make the change in that relationship, it's the state itself. That's a really good point, uh, Tony. Um, we're talking in, in many cases about the capabilities of individual people themselves. It's not they're just being done to. There's, there's, they're part of the system. <laughs> uh, and what we're doing is supporting and creating the environment to facilitate the capabilities in people as well as the, 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 the instruments and institutions that are delivering services themselves. Jean, you, you've got a, your hand up there. Yes, I just wanted to um, to add in the, the issue of, again, of worldview. So if, if I give you an example, um, the numeracy and literacy um, in the UK um, with the OEDC figures are the lowest in all the developed world. And our policy response is to tighten up the machine. So mm. we tell we, we, we measure the, the schools, we measure the teachers, we measure the, the, the pupils. We, we, we put in this kind of mechanical view of we tell people exactly what to teach, in what way to teach it, they have to have their lesson plans. Whereas um, if you take uh, Finland, uh, the, the, the educational process is systemic. They teach about a, a pond, for example. So they teach the mass of the pond and they write about the pond they start school later, they have shorter um, working weeks, they have, uh, they're higher um, in happiness, and they have much nu greater numeracy and literacy figures. So there's something about this, this paternalistic, mechanistic worldview that, that government sits with, which, which is fears um, what would happen if you, let it, if you let it loose, if you let the people in Liverpool do what they thought was, was good in Liverpool. That, that's what we've got to tackle. And I think we can tackle it sometimes through examples from other countries or good examples in this country to try and kind of break out of this, this, you know, if we don't tell people exactly what to do, it'll all go wrong and, you know, nobody will learn. So that, I'm back to that world view, I think. <laughs> Well, just building on, on, on that point, Jean, um, and this is something you raised, Ray, that, that we have in, intuitively or instinctively within us the capacity to think more systemically. Uh, um, that's, we're born with that, and we spend a lot of our education trying to uh, teach our young people to think l linear in a more direct fashion, and we subsequently build our further education to further that paradigm in a world that's calling for the exact opposite. So. We've known about systems thinking for quite some time, but why aren't we seeing more in, in, in terms of the change in, in education, um, both within our young, within further education, also within institutional leaders? What, what's holding us back and what, what should we be doing? Because it feels like an important part of this discussion. Anyone want to take that one on? I'm looking at you, Ray, because I I can see you. Thank you. Points. Yes, well, I, I I could easily jump in all the time, so I'm yeah. trying to give others an opportunity first. Um, uh, I think in the audience I have a, a a PhD student who's asking these sorts of questions. Uh, they're a very important lot of questions, and um, uh, the e answers are not uh, always readily apparent. Um, I'll just come back to Patrick's um, Buckminster Fuller idea about um, practice leading to theory versus theory leading to practice. Uh, someone else once said that there's no nothing so uh, practical as a good idea. Um, so, I mean, this is a, an interesting sort of issue. And if you're equipped 
with a way of engaging with the world. And I really agree with Jean, what Jean has had to say about how you engage with situations and pick up patterns, relationships, breakdown in patterns, concentrations of patterns, etc. cetera. Uh, we, we don't develop that literacy uh, early on. And we often do it through a whole set of historical institutional arrangements which shape how we think and act, many of which we are born into and we take for granted, except that they're all human inventions. And if they're human inventions, that means that we can reinvent them. We can actually commission them to oblivion if we wish to. Human institutions are that sort of thing. And we don't, if I go off on a slight hobby horse, one of the classics is the concept of the environment. At some, at some historical moment, we treated the environment, largely through economics, as an externality, a thing out there to be added to an economy. Whereas if you lay, take the French concept of environ, it's that which surrounds, or even the systems thinking concept, that you distinguish a system from its environment. It's a relational dynamic. And we, uh, we much like snails, carry our environment on our backs. We are here in an, a technological environment at this moment. We can't, it's inescapable, our environment. Yet we treat environment as a thing, as an externality. And uh, I have written elsewhere that the BBC has partly perpetuated this because it's created this concept through TV of a pristine nature which is independent of us. And our education system doesn't, as um, uh, Jean intimated, doesn't, uh, like the Finns, go out and engage with an environment and understand it in the context of what's in the schoolyard or beyond. It's an abstracted concept. So it's a long way of saying that many of our practices in many aspects of our society are structured through historical ways of thinking and acting and institutional arrangements which need to be deframed and reframed and till we get onto a different trajectory. Yeah, thanks very much for, for that, Ray. We, we, I think you know, the consequence of what you're saying, we may be trying to do systems thinking to reinforce existing legacy structures and paradigms, which might, might end up doubling down on something that needs to be more fundamentally rethought from the bottom up. But Orsan, you've got your hand up. Do you want to uh, um, ask your question? Uh, it's a, the, uh, this would be fantastic if it's possible. I didn't yes. want to. <clears throat> I didn't even don't want to disturb this great discussion. Very thought provoking. All the all the contributions. The one only one thing I want to highlight: the central problem, I think, systemic problem, um, which is I think like point of view. All the speakers are contribu contributing from is a kind of uh, how can I say. There, I think there are really successful systems managing, complexity managing actors in the world. For example, Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, Chinese, Xi Jinping, Putin, Erdogan, they are controlling, managing their own complexity so powerfully, successfully. These are, I think, all the contexts we are referring to are embedded in the hierarchy of the uh, like let, let's say interstate system or or the power power structures already established has an impact on the lower level contexts, which uh, we, if we think interstate system is embedded in or nested in the biosphere and technosphere and uh, noosphere, I think any context lower level context needs to be able to uh, recognize and embrace that kind of higher level constraints on their own uh, locality so i wonder how can how can uh, anyway this this is some sort of uh, position of the, the certain any position of change um, complexity management uh, has to re I, 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 I am have, having difficulty to formulate this but there's some sort of uh, engagement is needed to address any level, local level, um, social context in which you have to take a decision, decide uh, on any complex, how, what your action will be. Uh, how, I wonder, how do you think about this, this problem? 
of 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 let's say for example the manage complexity management of higher level actors are are they can be a constraint obstacle on the uh, on the approach we are looking for for humanity or for all, for everybody or for majority of people is a difficult difficulty for the those actors having managing their own complexities from their, their own perspectives successfully so successfully that they uh, create obstacles they become an obstacle for people's approach for example Yes, that's a, that's a great question, Olson. I just want, because uh, it's something, that, Patrick, you mentioned that the fact that al almost anything we do is we're now seeing a reaction <laughs> uh, and a consequence that maybe where it was an externality of the way we do things that was hidden from us. So this sense that we have multiple actors at local, national, international level, uh, lots of institutions doing their thing, but what is best for humanity and best for the planet and how does that bigger perspective feed down and shape decision making lower down those hierarchies? Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a big existential question, of course, that sits underneath where, where we are with COP26. But uh, anyone want to uh, have, a, have a crack at that one? I mean, I don't want to point the finger, but I would be really interested in Aku's uh, experience working in multiple countries to try and innovate in various health systems. I'm sure you must have insights into that question. Yes, Aku, maybe I could slightly reframe it because it was it was quite a big existential one. Though. Um, when we have multiple actors that have their own silos, and you talked about the time horizons that they work on, uh, and we needed we need more collaborative coordinated action that transcends multiple actors to bring about some of these uh, outcomes especially in health where there are multiple factors involved what what are you seeing Akko, as, as ways to mobilize actors to transcend their siloed interests to bring about greater collaboration for the, for, for the for greater health and, and one could say greater good greater good indeed uh, no i wanted to come back to raise uh, emphasis on, on history, because I think history is so important. Oftentimes in health systems, we don't actually um, regard it. And, uh, and when we start talking about complexity and causal loops and um, path dependency, of course, history becomes uh, absolutely critical as a determinant. Um, but this particular question, I think, is really interesting because um, my observations have been that in as much as we want to speak about um, multi-sectoral approaches, you know, we think about Alma Atta and all of these sort of indications that things that we've been speaking about for decades and we haven't really made progress on it. One of the challenges of multi-sectoral approaches is really that we expect people to just do it because good thing. And number one, um, you know, most of our governments are just not architected to. So you start looking at things like whole of government approaches, or you start looking in countries where they have been able to, um, um, yeah, have, have more sort of uh, collaborative approaches. And you find that it depends on where is an initiative uh, placed within the government? Is it in the prime minister's office or is it in a particular um, ministry? In which ministry? Is it a, a well-resourced or a powerful ministry uh, versus a, a lesser ministry? So, so, so the architecture of government completely matters. And that's one thing that we have not paid attention to. And then the second thing that I would say is that it also comes down to um, the soft skills. You know, a lot of this work is really about people learning to negotiate with one another, people learning to partner with one another. There's a conversation in the chat about languages and, you know, the opportunities to actually bring people together and give them the time to understand how one another is actually seeing the challenge. So that is important. Um, the issue of how monies flow is really important. If we have an initiative that we're all working on, are we um, each putting into a, a joint, a pooled budget, or are, do we have earmarked budgets for specific activities? And then who gets um, you know, the acclaim for the success? So those are all of the things that um, tangibly actually militate against multi-sectoral approaches. And so I think that we have to go a little bit further than just saying that, yes, multi-sectoral approach is good, it's efficient, it's effective, it's equitable, and actually look at, well, um, 
is government as one entity, even before we then move into the other kinds of actors in the health system, but is, is government actually architected to enable um, the ways that we want people to work? And then are we actually giving people the skills to negotiate with one another, to understand one another? And then again, do we actually have the time um, although I do take um, Patrick's point that, you know, sometimes uh, things do work in the short term, but then that, that creates other problems. Success is also a problem as well. So let me pause there. But um, I think that those are some of the reasons why this challenge is, is, a, is an intransigent one. Thank you very much, Aku. That was that was very, very useful insight. Um, I, I wonder if I could just um, ask Tony to respond to uh, Martin Kunk's question, which is sort of building upon this, which he's pushing this point a little bit further. Is it about negotiation between different actors or is it about the ability to agree on a shared vision that transcends the different silos and sectors to which they can all feel called to participate in? Um, and how you found, what, what role that has played in the success you've been having at Liverpool? I think actually it's both because it's really important to have a shared vision, a shared sense of purpose. I think you need to break that down into really sharp outcomes where you're agreeing what success looks like. And you need to keep coming back to this to keep, as people tend to slip back into their vested interests and their learned behavior to keep bringing back, bringing people back collectively to that shared sense of purpose those outcomes, that vision, in order to, um, to get things moving in the right direction again. But it also requires some the whole system to behave differently. So, for example, I talked before about taking things down to neighborhood level. And in implicit, if you, if you take the healthcare model, implicit in this is taking more resources out of acute settings into community settings um, so that we can... Um, we, we can prevent um, ill health in the first place rather than having an ill health system, which is what happens if all the resources go into the acute system. That potentially creates significant financial problems for, the, for say, an acute hospital. And of course, um, whilst people would be very willing to buy into a shared vision, when that starts undermining the financial integrity of their organisation, they have a very difficult place to... Um, to navigate from and for me the way to get this right and this is where the negotiation comes in up front not just having a shared vision but it's about how the system will solve the, the the problems that it creates as it goes through that change process and that becomes a problem for the whole system so an example of this would be uh, if we want to move away from um say diabetic specialists treating people who are diabetics solely in hospital to working with communities to prevent diabetes in the first place. You create a new um, flow of cash or a new revenue stream into the acute setting, but they're working outside the boundaries of the normal um, acute hospital, and they're actually working in the community. And so I, I think it's a combination of those things, and it's something you need to constantly work on as a system and be aware of the problems that are there Otherwise, you drive people back into those sectional interests and those um, those siloed behaviours. Thank you very much, Tony. Right, we're coming to the end of the Q and A, but we've got three hands raised from three of our speakers, so we've obviously hit a, a, a rich vein of interest here. So let's go, Ray, then Patrick, then Jean. So Ray, uh, thanks very much. Just uh, picking up Aku, thank you for that illuminating uh, examples and. I, uh, I've done quite a lot of research uh, on the concept of social learning and how you bring people together in organisations and out of silos. And what we discovered was that um, wherever you had a, um, a round table or a, a platform in which brought different stakeholders from different parts of uh, organisations or from different organisations together, where they came as representatives of those organizations or their departments, no social learning ensued because they became defenders of their own perspectives or their own organization's perspective. Uh, and so we need to break out of this notion that just getting the people in the room is the right answer. That is only not even the beginning of it really. 
and uh, how you uh, create the circumstances whereby people are open to learning together is the critical issue. And that requires practices and institutions and arrangements. And it requires ditching certain concepts because the lowest, one of the most undermining things for effective action is the concept of consensus. Consensus is a lowest common denominator phenomenon. And what we need to value is difference and accommodations between difference because that's where variety comes from. And I just want to pick up on Tony's point. I thought Tony's example was a lovely example of boundary shifting. You, you, you change the boundary of the system of interest and you get all sorts of innovation and you do different things. Patrick. Um, yeah, I wanted to partly respond to, to something you said, Andy, about you know the, the, the where do you start with when you've got multiple agents and and you know different levels and well this is this is how it always is it's how it always is and i think i think the systems community is kind of a bit schizophrenic on this so th there's a tendency to go oh you need to go up um you know to, to encompass as much of the thing as the, the problem space as you possibly can and countervailing that you've got the no you need to go down to the grassroots and i think i think tony was quite rightly um talking about about some of that you know action action at a local level and, and it, it's, it's kind of context is dependent, you know, and, and really the answer is you act where you can act. Um, and that won't always be foolproof because there will always be stuff either from above or below or sideways that can impinge on that. But you act where you act and you protect the you protect the change, you know, manage the boundaries of the change system. And that works generally works pretty, pretty well. Um, I just wanted to really 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 quickly come back on on something that, that, that tony said and, and and around that um that shift of uh, for diabetes and i mean this is this is a classic thing in, in in health systems we looked at commissioning in health systems across about a quarter of the country uh, for a project once and could find almost no evidence of, of it actually of actual proper commissioning like we're going to change the services and part of the reason is because they won't decommission and you've got to, you know, to commission something new, you've got to decommission something old. And I think there's a massive, massive effect you can have by deconstructing the system that is in place to make way for something else. You know, as long as the engine is driving things to produce the emergent properties that it's producing at the moment, as long as that you know, the patterns that Gene was talking about are in place and active and the dynamics are running, it'll carry on doing what it's what it's doing. Part, you know, half of the battle, at least half of the battle is decommissioning what's there, not commissioning what's new. Well, it's less sexy, but it, it, it's, it's at least as powerful. That's a really good point, Patrick. I think, I think Dave Snowden sort of riffs on a, a similar thing about using complicated approaches to complex issues. You're trying to sort of nail more jelly to the wall with more elaborate systems that then die in their own complexity and costs. And there is a, a decommissioning required as we understand how better to address some of the challenges that we're seeing. Gene, let's 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 go to to you for the for the final word on on this Q and A. Um. I think something that we're not saying when when it comes to talking about getting people to think more systemically or to think in in um, about complexity is that um, this doesn't this doesn't sit well with everybody. There's a kind of personality uh, characteristic issue here. So I, I think we need to address that. There's a there's some people love uncertainty and complexity. I I love it. I don't want to be told what to do and have certainty. That would be awful. You know, how could I live my life in, in that way? But lots of people don't feel like that. They they find it um, intimidating and uncomfortable. They want to be more secure about what they're doing. And I think we need to address that in our in our teaching uh, around systems thinking and, and complexity. We need to address it in how we promote people, what we value in people. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think as leaders, we need to accept that sometimes we're the people who soak up the complexity and, and the, the, the big picture systemic thinking, and we make things more certain for other people who, who want to just get on and do something. So 
that's it's it's an uncomfortable thing to say, perhaps. But um, if you take a, a model like Myers Briggs, you know the the ends uh, are much more comfortable with with pattern spotting, for example, than than the the S's. And can we can we speak about that um, and uh, recognise that kind of diversity, which is a useful diversity, as, as Ray was saying, it's not something to to get rid of, but we need to think about that too. Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Jean, for that. And thank you very much for, for, for the questions and thank you very much for the, for the dialogue. I think we covered a lot of uh, really interesting ground there. Um, I'd like now at this moment to move to introduce to you uh, Mike Jackson. Uh, many of you may in fact know Mike. He's, he's uh, well known uh, for good reasons in this field as being one of the leading thinkers in this area. Uh, as you can see there, Mike has worked in civil service and academia as a consultant. 40 years ago, he established a research program at the University of Hull, which led to the establishment of the Center for System Studies and to the birth and development of critical systems thinking, a topic in which he's published 10 books and over 150 articles. Um, so, Mike, I know you've been listening intently to the conversations that we've been having uh, uh, and, and the dialogue that's built around this. We've covered a, a lot of ground and I'm sure you're itching to give us your thoughts and reflections on what you've heard today. Um, we're, we're gonna be working on the Critical Systems Forum as part of the en uh, Enlightened Enterprise Academy, which uh, Mike's gonna be a, a key driver of, which we're really gonna develop and look further at some of these capability gap issues. So Mike, uh, I'll hand over to you. Just before I do that though, there's um, just to remind people that following this conversation with Mike uh, and some closing remarks from Paul, we, uh, we're gonna have an optional breakout discussion session. For those who want to stay on a, a little bit longer, we're gonna break into discussion groups just to explore some of the ideas that have come out today. Because I, I, uh, in the Q and A, we, we've surfaced some of the issues, but I'm sure there's more to say on, on many of these issues. So there's an opportunity for us in breakout groups to go a little deeper. So just to let you know about that, but uh, I'll hand over now to, to you, Mike, for, for your thoughts and reflections. Thank you, Andy. I, I think itching is a good word. In fact, I, I, uh, I didn't realize how patient I was <laughs> to sit for, uh, sit for two hours. Um, without without uh, shouting and coming in, but it's been a fantastic discussion. Um, and very very difficult to to pick so many points raised. It's it's quite difficult to pick out uh, the uh, the key ones. But I, I'll try to do uh, that, and I'll try to do it uh, by uh, bringing out the commonalities between um, the speakers and the systems uh, respondents. And and I've got six points, so just maybe two minutes on each of those. Uh, first, there's a, there's a lot of commonality in the way that people have talked about the world that decision makers uh, and managers face these days. We've, we've heard the words wicked, wicked problems, uh, complexity, uh, non-linearity, non the, the systemic nature of the world and its un unpredictability such as Rupert's, uh, Rupert's escapade being locked out of his office, I guess. Good example of that today. Uh, and we've had some uh, definitions, uh, some spec specifications of why the world is like that. Um, interrelatedness, uh, connectivity is one. Uh, Tony started by talking about the productivity gap in, uh, in, in the UK and between the North and the South. Uh, and then that broadened out, uh, and the reason for low productivity, as he saw it in Liverpool, were things like skills and education and housing and health. So it broadened out to a whole set of interrelationships which were involved. And similarly with ACU, uh, talking about particular interventions uh, and then recognising the extent to which the context interrelated with particular uh, interventions and, and, and therefore had an an impact. And this means that, uh, as Tony put it, you have to involve a whole wide variety of stakeholders. And he was talking about getting various stakeholders to sit down together to uh, address the issues. And that means 
uh, getting them to work uh, outside their silos. So the issues that we face cross boundaries um, and people have to be brought somehow out, out of their silos uh, in order to uh, address them in the way that Tony was talking about in Liverpool. Um, my, my second point is that the, and I don't have to spend time on this much really, because everybody is seeming to agree that uh, system thinking, complexity thinking is needed. Uh, to deal with the kind of wicked, complex, systemic, messy problems that we uh, have to uh, navigate or manage these days. Um, I, I, and I guess that's because it, it puts interactions and interrelationships uh, very much up front in thinking about issues, interactions between parts, causal relationships between parts, and interrelationships between uh, stakeholders. And apart from the areas we've heard about today, uh, local government and health, and I'm sure we will talk about government itself. In the last month, I, I've done keynotes at project management conferences and engineering conferences, and they all say the same. The system thinking is uh, essential. But we do have to, as Aku say, get the terminology uh, right. Um, we, we have to think through what we mean by systems thinking. We have to make it easier for, to understand for decision makers. Patrick said we can do that, and I believe that's the case. And we have to be able to demonstrate uh, that it actually uh, works. So we're not just talking uh, about concepts and ideas and philosophies, uh, but we have to demonstrate that system thinking can actually work in practice and that we have methodologies and methods that we can employ to ensure that's the case. Moving on to my third point, um, Jean said uh, it's a worldview issue. Uh, and I think that's a very powerful way of putting it. Uh, how do we change people's mindset from the sort of mechanistic way of thinking, which continues to dominate in the command and control institutions that we uh, work in and confront. Uh, Aku put it that in health, uh, with, it's dominated by the clinical and biomedical perspective, uh, and also coming up against command and control uh, thinking. Somehow we have to get people to think differently, uh, to embrace complexity, uh, as Jean said, to bring in different ways of thinking, uh, as Patrick said. Uh, and there are difficulties in doing this for, for the reasons, again, that have been mentioned, people's personalities, the education that they've had, the organisations in which they work and the way they've got used to working. Uh, in my view, we, we have to get them familiar enough inhabiting alternative perspectives and alternative worldviews so that they feel comfortable uh, looking at issues and problem situations as living systems as well as mechanistic systems. I don't want to abandon the mechanistic system thinking because I think that's very powerful as well. But they have to become equally comfortable in looking at it through a living systems organismic perspective. They have to uh, be able to shift towards looking at it as a matter of uh, purposeful systems bringing people together, stakeholders together to reach accommodations, as Ray put it, uh, to find feasible and desirable ways uh, forward. We always have to look to the inequalities that we might be doing something about or uh, exa exacerbating, and we have to look to the environment and, and how we might be uh, how we might be affecting that. And of course, the interrelationships between all these things. Uh, and I'm pretty sure. And I, I read the parliamentary report on the um, on the initial reactions to COVID. Uh, and the group think that surrounded the, <clears throat> the SAGE based uh, models on how the epidemic might uh, develop. And I'm pretty sure if people are able to operate with alternative worldviews uh, in the way that I've been suggesting, that could not possibly have happened. There would have been uh, challenging uh, perspectives brought, in, brought to bear. The, um, the report calls it red team thinking, and that is a uh, well-known uh, systems approach. It'd been impossible not to think in terms of how disadvantaged groups might have suffered more, more from the pandemic than 
uh, than other groups. It would have been impossible not to have found better ways of thinking of how to handle the beginnings of the academic in terms of centralization versus decentralization. So the ability to handle different worldviews, uh, different perspectives is I think a crucial thing that systems thinking uh, can, uh, can, can bring. Uh, everybody talks about Einstein. It's all over the place. You can't solve the problems you've got with the worldview that created those problems. There's another one that's becoming equally popular from uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is that the test of a, a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And I think systems thinking can enable us to do this by developing some strong alternative worldviews for managing, navigating, embracing uh, complexity. My fourth point um, is about the range of systems approaches that we have. Uh, we, we, we can actually use systems approaches to uh, bring results. We can respond to the multidimensional nature uh, of wicked problems, uh, I would argue. Uh, and Patrick powerfully pointed out uh, the range of approaches and methodologies that systems thinking can bring to bear. And these are based upon alternative worldviews. The viable system model was mentioned, which is based upon a living systems organismic uh, worldview. Soft systems approaches, which Ray hinted at, based upon purposeful system uh, worldview. The alternative systems approaches based upon um, the notion that some groups are disadvantaged as a result, as a result of the way that systems operate. Uh, and we can bring all these to bear on the multidimensional problems uh, that exist uh, and use them in, in a pragmatic way, in a combined way. So we get an overall response to those problems. And I don't think necessarily that the, sometimes, some of these, Aku was saying it's an issue of time and the temple issue. Uh, that's true through the mechanistic point of view, the biomedical point of view, where you want to see instant results. As soon as you start seeing the world uh, through an organismic living systems point of view, uh, and, and you're looking at the ability to be resilient and to be anti-fragile over, over periods of time, then obviously you need to evaluate over longer periods. And something like the viable system model has ways of uh, has ways of uh, doing that. So we have uh, a range of pragmatic, uh, convincing systems approaches, which correspond to the different mindsets that I believe systems thinking uh, asks decision makers to be able to operate with. My fifth point was, I think, made most powerfully by, uh, by, by Ray, but, al but also uh, by other speakers, uh, by Tony and by Aku. Uh, and that certainly in my mind, and clearly not in Ray's mind as well, uh, systems thinking is not some sort of special arcane uh, knowledge to be brought from the outside uh, and to replace the experience of uh, decision makers with. Um, Patrick said it, it, it's it's um, it's practice first, and, and practice then might look to theory, but you don't start with the theory. Uh, Ray's way of, of, of putting it was that we, we must start from the practice part with, um, with the decision makers, with the stakeholders, understand their different perspectives and see on the basis of their different perspectives how we might work with them to bring about accommodations that yield feasible and desirable changes. And this, of course, speaks to Aku's point about, local, about localization uh, and the relevance of systems thinking in international contexts in other countries. Uh, it won't be relevant if we try and bring in some sort of Western-based knowledge, uh, which has no relevance to the setting. We have to work from where people's think thinking is at the moment and help them to think through better uh, the problem situations that they face. And I believe that the systems thinking that all of the systems contributors have mentioned and talked about today is of that kind. We don't believe we have the solution to the world's problems, 
we believe, I hope modestly, that we can help decision makers uh, enhance their experience with ways of thinking that may be helpful to them in a situation that they uh, that they that they face. Um, and my final point is that we started the critical systems forum for the reasons that some people have mentioned uh, that systems thinking despite the best efforts of um, the open university which is which is still producing wonderful courses uh, and despite the best effort at, at hull and, and else and elsewhere this stuff isn't taught very much um, in in universities um, you can there's all kinds of reasons why that might be the case uh, but the main one i believe is that universities are based upon disciplines and this requires system thinking is a transdisciplinary approach and the world's problems won't yield to any one discipline. Uh, they require us to adopt the transdisciplinary approach like systems thinking and like complexity theory, if we're ever going to be able to manage, navigate uh, and embrace and work with uh, the, the issues to, Im to, to improve things. And it's very sad that universities are structured that way uh, around the disciplines. So it seemed to me that something uh, needed doing about this and help hence the critical systems forum um, the demand for systems thinking is i think as i've already alluded to uh massive tony talked about how it was needed in local government katie wants it spread to all the big four consultancies let's hope that can happen um and um and and in health aku is leading the initiative to make sure that uh, that health uh, the public health systems are uh, public health issues addressed by uh, systems thinking. The point of the uh, critical systems forum was to bring people, serious decision makers, together with serious systems thinkers to try and bridge this um, system thinking capabilities gap. Uh, and the discussion has been great today, and I hope that we started to take that uh, to take that forward. So, before handing back to uh, Andy and Paul, I'd just like to thank uh, Aku and Tony and Katie, the speakers, and the three systems responders uh, for engaging us in, I think, what has been uh, a, a, won a wonderful debate. And I hope I've captured something of that in, in what I've said. We're facing difficult problems. We need systems thinking. Uh, it's about a change of mindset as much as anything else, uh, working with alternative to the mechanistic mode of thinking. We have a range of systems approaches which can uh, corresp correspond to those different ways of thinking uh, and therefore uh, enable us to get things done and address multidimensional problem situations. This is not expertise which is trying to replace uh, experience and decision making. It's trying to work with decision makers from where they are at the moment and aid that decision making. Uh, and I do think that we're at the stage where uh, we're capable uh, working with decision makers uh, of bringing systems ideas forward in a useful way, which will help to close the uh, capabilities gap. And I hope the critical systems forum can contribute to that. So thanks, uh, thanks for the discussion. Thanks very much, Mike. That was uh, a, a, a very erudite, I think, summary of the, of the conversation we've had and some, some of your own uh, important reflections on that. Um, we're now going to head into the closing remarks. So I will hand over to Paul, Paul Barnett, who is the force and brains and energy behind the Enlightened Enterprise Academy. He, he runs it as uh, a chief exec. So, Paul, I, I'll hand over to you, and I, I believe you've got some sort of updates uh, on the future agenda that you'd like to share with everyone. So, Paul, over to you. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, and echoing Mike's comments, I think I'd like to just thank everybody for what's been a fantastic uh, afternoon. I mean, I think the speakers and the system thinkers, the insights have just been amazing. Um, it's a real pity we didn't hear from Rupert, but um, I know Rupert's very keen to engage, so I'm sure we will we'll get an interview and get his thoughts um, at a later date. Um, what, well, Andy mentioned at the very beginning that 
the Critical Systems Forum, we're looking to evolve this into a systems a critical systems thinking institute. Um, so there'll be announcements on that uh, very soon. And I can't go into detail on, on other uh, things that we've got in mind. Um, again, I'll follow up on today with some further announcements. Um, we've developed some courses uh, with Mike, um, which we're going to start delivering in from January onwards, uh, primarily aimed at executives. Um, I'll mention some details of that in the follow up. Um, there's going to be several future events. We've already uh, got some ideas in the pipeline, but um, I'd be very keen to hear your thoughts on uh, what do you think the future agenda for this forum and later institute uh, really ought to be so we can try to prioritize it in ways that are most appealing to the community that we're trying to bring together. Um, and finally, if you're not already a member of the, uh, the forum's LinkedIn group, please join the group because all announcements um, about anything in the future will also be made uh, through the group. And the conversations that we've started today, we'll try and take the threads from the chat and um, look at incorporating those in the discussions within the LinkedIn forum.